Okay, so fitness and measurement, how we can tell organisms if they're fit or uh, they have an advantage, we look at fitness. And fitness is how many offsprings that it can uh, produce. So if we're looking at toads here, um, the population of toads has two different phenotypes, green and brown. The green leaves on average four offspring in the next generation. The brown only leaves 2.5, so therefore the green toad has a higher fitness. As you can see here, 4 divided by 4, 2.5 divided by 4 is lower. So fitness is all about how many offspring you can leave behind. It is also a combination of survival, because you have to be able to survive to reproduce. You also need to find a mate. So there's a lot of territorial large males that will mate with many females. And there's also small males, um, you know, because the, the big males, they're stealing all the girls, um, the small males don't really get a chance to mate. So we call this sexual selection. And then also the number of offspring. <coughs> so usually size um, is related to more eggs. So large females and fish will lay more eggs than smaller females. There is a disadvantage though. So for our large females, if they're laying more eggs, they'll probably die at a younger age because there's fewer opportunities to reproduce, but they're also expending energy in those eggs. So you can see here with water striders how larger female striders lay more eggs per day. They survive for a shorter period of time, and as a result, our intermediate-sized um, uh, water striders produce more op the optimal offspring. So here's three um, tables here which shows number of eggs laid per day with the length of the water strider. So you can see that our larger females lay more eggs. Here's the length of an adult female water strider with the lifespan. So the larger the water strider is, the um, lifespan is shorter. So really mm -hmm. the intermediate length water striders are, have the higher fitness. We can also look at interactions among evolutionary forces. So like, yes, we've talked about mutation and genetic drift. Um, but remember, mutation is rare. It's a very small occurrence. Um, if allele big B mutates to a small b, then it could be maintained. It can maintain um, uh, the allele frequency. We also know that genetic drift can counter natural selection, so it can go against what nature selects for. So um, remember, genetic drift and natural selection they both act to remove variation from a population. Because if you don't have a trait that's um, fits for that environment, you may not survive. But natural selection is non-random. It works to increase alleles that increase success, mm -hmm. while genetic drift is random and in which any allele may increase. Um, but like I said here, genetic drift could decrease the frequency of allele, allele that is favored by selection, so it can work against natural selection. We also have gene flow um, that could also promote evolutionary change. So gene flow could spread beneficial mutations that arise in one population to a different population. It could also stop adaptation within a population. So it could um, bring in inferior alleles from a different population. So it works both ways. And um, so here's an example of gene flow opposing natural selection in bent grass. Uh, there are these abandoned mine sites in Great Britain. And there, this means the brackets mean concentration. So there's a high concentration of metal in the soil usually toxic to plants. But some plants have adapted for this. They have alleles at certain sites on their genes that they can tolerate these levels. Now, if we were to take these grass, this bent grass that thrives in the metal contaminated soil and transplant them um, to an unpolluted site, they actually have lower growth weight rates. So it's actually kind of a unique uh, thing. So it's an observation that people have, have looked at. So here's a table showing um, depict in this, where here I have non-mine soil, mine soil, non-mine <clears throat> soil. Um, you can see that it thrives in the mine, mine soil, and then when we move it, it doesn't do so great. Okay, so then there's some questions there. Good old questions. Yep, good old questions. All right, I've got okay, I gotta find part three. <clears throat> Take your time. Yeah. Take yeah. my time. Yeah. Positive. This uh, so how many questions are you putting on the end of this test for like our final? I'm making it right now. Oh. I'll let you know tomorrow. Oh boy, is it like gonna be hard? You'd say or hardest test of the year? It's a final. Is there is there a so, cur yeah. is there a curve? I'm thinking the short answers. Oh. No. Do you want multiple choice? 
one. I don't know. Why she's saying that? Maybe short answer is better. <laughs> but like sometimes I give a short answer and I literally have zero clue what to write, so mm -hmm. I sit there just staring. Okay. Well, well, let's all do what Carly wants, I guess. Okay, Carly chapter time. twenty, part three. So in the last section here, you don't have the slide. Natural selection was a process that removed variation from a population by favoring one allele over others. And we know that in some circumstances, selection can do the opposite. And that means that it can actually help maintain population variation. So we're going to talk about how uh, it's the opposite, how we're, we can maintain population variation. So the maintenance of variation, uh, we kind of look at frequency-dependent selection. In frequency-dependent selection, uh, the fitness of the phenotype depends on the frequency, how often or the occurrence of it within that population. And there's two types. The first type is called negative frequency, which means that the rare phenotypes are favored by selection. Predators, when they are hunting, uh, you know, like a, a herd or something, they do a search image. And what they'll do is they pick out certain objects that are rare forms. Um, or, sorry, da, 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 da. They pick out the, the common. Um, organisms and the ones that look funny that don't meet their search image, they're preyed less upon. Sorry, I had that mixed up. So if there's like an albino one, they probably wouldn't want to eat it. Or... Wait, rare phenol... Oh, now I'm getting them mixed up. Gosh darn it. <laughs> ah, okay. Just delete everything from your brain in the last 30 seconds. Negative frequency. Rare phenotypes are favored by selection. So that means the funny looking ones are preyed upon. There so we the go. the albino one dies. Yes, the albino one dies. The one that has the gimp dies, okay? Like, there we go. So, uh, a graph showing um, these shells, this, these snails, I should say, um, and how it corresponds to a uh, trematode genotype. So you, you kind of see this, like, graph here, and then you see a dotted one. So you, whenever you see a graph like this, you can say, oh, that is negative frequency dependent. Now, the other one is positive, which means it favors the common forms, it eliminates the variation from the population. I feel like I have these mixed up. Yeah, I feel like it means favor, but Yes, you are absolutely right. I suck. <laughs> it's all right. It happens. Gosh. And I just, like, went through this, and I'm like, don't get them mixed up. Don't get them mixed up. Eh. Okay. So is positive good for the predator or the prey? The predator. The predator. Okay. That's Wait, that's Wait that's but both of them are bad for the prey. Someone yeah. dies yeah. in both yes. of them. Yes, so. yeah. Well, so but the oddballs are more easier to pick out, but maybe there's less oddballs. I don't know. <laughs> so wow. Worse for the weird ones. So rare phenotypes are favored, which means that they don't die. Yeah, they're, they and this they're one, there. they do die. Okay. okay. So the weirdos die. Yeah, the weirdos die. There we go. <laughs> we also have... Oscillating selections, which means that the favored phenotype, the one that lives, changes as the environmental conditions change. So here we're going to talk a little bit about our finches, the Galapagos Islands medium ground finch. If there's a drought, small soft seeds are depleted, but the tough large seeds are still on the ground, so our big beak finches will be favored. When it's rainy, then there's abundant soft seeds, which means the small beaks will be favored. So you can see it oscillates between the sizes of beaks dependent on the environmental conditions. So here's a diagram here depicting the finch, where during a dry year, the beak depth is larger. And then during rainy seasons, the beak depth uh, goes to a smaller size. And in drought year, you can see that it peaks. I just glanced at that fish picture, and I thought it had a well, yeah, oh. What is that frequency of left jaw? Yes, um, some fish, their jaws will be off-centered, and it's, it's, I think it's for the jawfish. So they can be towards the left side or the right side, and so it oscillates. And I don't know what, what the advantage would be, but it does oscillate. So you can see that in 82. Wait, is, is that the fish next, swimming next to it that yeah. we're talking yeah. about? Yes, yeah. yep. Um, so in, um, yeah, this fish right here. Not <laughs> I'm looking at the big fish, I'm like, what? <laughs> They're the There's same. No There's um, so here would be left, here would be right, left, right, left. Okay. Yeah. The difference um, between oscillating selection and frequency dependent selection is that with oscillating, um, it does not depend on frequency, it's the environment that changes it. But with frequency, it just means that um, it, it depends on the frequencies. 
but they're both forms of selection. So. In some cases, the heterozygotes, kind of like your carriers, have the greater fitness than homozygotes. I have talked about sickle cell anemia before. Remember, sickle cell anemia produces abnormal red blood cells. They're in a sickle shape. Sickle cell anemia people are less susceptible to malaria, and malaria is caused by Plasmodium um, falciparium. I really need to take Latin someday. But what this paris or what malaria does is this Plasmodium enters the red blood cell, causes extreme low oxygen levels, cells are quickly filtered out, and the parasite gets eliminated. So if you are a carrier for sickle cell anemia, it's actually an advantage for you. So on this graph here, these are the people that do not have sickle cell. These are the people that have sickle cell. And by the way, this is like survivor. So obviously, if you have sickle cell, like full on, 100%, yeah, your mortality rate's pretty low. But if you are a carrier, notice it says AS. So you have normal plus a sickle cell allele. Notice that your fitness is higher than those that do not have sickle cell. And this is only in certain parts of the world, Africa. In, in the United States, you, you would want to be... Right, you don't want an allele for sickle cell. Now in this picture here, you can see the plasmonium is literally rupturing from the red blood cells. Um, sickle cell, normal red blood cell, here's the life cycle of plasmodium. It lives in the saliva of the mosquitoes. So then when the mosquitoes um, suck your blood, they actually exchange or, I don't know, secrete their saliva, so what makes it itch gets into your, your bloodstream with the, the plasmonium. You can see that it affects red blood cells, and you can see it burst out. It's awesome. I mean, it's, it's bad, but it's awesome. So. Okay. We can also have selection that acts on multiple genes. So remember traits, a lot of um, traits are dependent on how many genes interact with each other. So like human height, multiple genes are involved here. But there are three types of selection for the multiple genes, and the first one's called disruptive selection, which means we are going to remove our intermediates. So think about a bell curve. Got a bell curve in your head? We're gonna move, we're gonna eliminate the, the peak of your bell curve. Okay? So, like yep, so you're gonna have two extremes left. So if we look at beak sizes of African black bellied seed cracker finch, say that five <coughs> times, um, the population have large and small beaks but few intermediates. That means that these finches feed on two seeds, the large and the small seeds, not the intermediates. The intermediates are unable to open the large seeds because their beaks are weak, and they're too, uh, they can't open up the small ones because it's too flimsy. So you get a nice little graph like this. So here is my bell curve. Mm -hmm. The intermediates don't survive because there's two different types of seeds, and they can't crack them open. So they are selected against. And so we have a favor of our um, large and small beaks. So you can see here, this is what's left, no intermediates. This, um, this is just another picture of butterflies. Uh, maybe the blue ones get selected against, and over time, we have this disruptive um, bell curve where we actually have two peaks on the extreme ends. We also have directional selection, where we're going to eliminate one of the extremes. So with Drosophila, um, in this population, they selected for negative phototropism which means that flies that moved toward the light were discarded and flies that stayed away from the light were used as parents and bred for the next generation and then they you know, discarded the ones that kept moving towards the light and kept the ones that avoided the light. So in later generations, um, there was a smaller chance that the offspring fly would actually move towards the light. So in this diagram, here's our bell curve and we selected against an extreme. So for later populations, you get some, it, it shifts over a little bit. So in this diagram here, the larger individuals are favored, and as a result, you'll have more larger individuals, whatever trait you're looking at. This diagram right here is looking at Drosophila again, but it's looking at a different trait. It's looking at bristles on the abdomen of the fruit fly. So what they did is they bred Drosophila in the lab, and they took the fruit flies that had lots of bristles on their butts, basically, okay? And they kept them as parents, and they bred. And then the next offspring, they looked at bristles, and they kept selecting the ones that had the most bristles. And eventually, um, you get some really, really hairy flies. So that's what they were just depicting, how you, you can actually select for traits. And you get a shift in the extreme. And then the last one is called the stabilizing selection, which means that both extremes are selected against. And so your intermediates are the ones that are going to be favored. Um, so here's my nice little bell curve. The extremes get selected against. As a result, the intermediates are going to thrive. They're going to carry on that allele. So in the next generation, 
you'll have more intermediates and less of the extremes. Um, here's a, a diagram looking at, so let's see here, woodpeckers and wasps post put pressure on gall fly populations so then the intermediate gall flies thrive compared to the large gall size. Okay, yeah, so the intermediate gets more. All right, moving on. Experimental studies of natural selection. I love this section. So Darwin, when he first thought of evolution, he thought it took millions of years. Okay, maybe not millions, maybe thousands of years in order for a change to happen. But the thing is about um, evolution is that it can happen in a short period of time. So I'm going to show you a case study within two years. Uh, and in this case study, they actually used indoor and outdoor um, labs to show their evidence. So we're going to look at guppies here. Pocilia reticulata. Here we go. <clears throat> so just to give you a background about these guppies. First, we're going to talk about where guppies can be found. So what they did is they looked at streams in South America and uh, in Trinidad. And the most interesting thing about these streams is that all these streams had waterfalls. And this is really important, and I'll explain why. But they found that guppies and other fish are capable of colonizing in portions of the streams above the waterfall. The waterfall is like a barrier. So a lot of times, fishes can't go up the waterfall. They kind of just stay at the pool after the waterfall. But guppies and a few other fish have this unique ability to colonize the area above a waterfall. So there's guppies you know, in these streams, and they looked at you know, waterfalls. They said, hey, guppies are found both up here and down here. They looked at three species. A killifish. Killifish, they're good colonizers, and the reason why they can colonize above a waterfall is that on rainy days, they will jump out of the stream onto damp leaves, and they'll just kind of flop their way to the top of the waterfall, and then they'll colonize it. Guppies, um, they can swim upstream. They can also colonize above the waterfall when it floods. So when the banks overflow, they'll take these little secondary channels and eventually get to the top of the waterfall. The last species they looked at was the pike um, chicklin, which is a predator. Uh, it was not capable of dispersal. It was restricted by waterfall, so it always stayed at the bottom of the waterfall. It was a predator. It feeds on guppies. It loves guppies. So we got our backgrounds, right? Streams with waterfalls and our three so species. The ones on the top obviously live. Okay. What they noticed was that there was a difference in the guppies above the waterfall and below the waterfall. At the bottom of the waterfall, the guppies were drabbed color, which means they were more camouflaged. They were brown. They were dull. Um, they suffered high predation. Their survival rates were really low. They reproduced at a really young age because they knew their lifespan was really short. And the adult sizes were extremely small. On top of the waterfall was a different story. Our guppies, they were very colorful. You can call them gaudy, if you will. Uh, low predation rates. They survived high. Um, they matured later on in life, and they obviously had larger sizes. So a scientist went out to see if he could mimic these in the lab. Okay. So what he did is he took large pools and he put them in greenhouses and he had 2,000 guppies and he divided them into 10 pools. I don't know the sizes of the pools. You can read um, about it. You can actually Google his paper. But what he did is six months later, well, okay, so he's got these guppies in the 10 pools and he just let them be guppies for six months, you know, just chill. Okay. Six months later, he added pike, which was the predator, to four of them. He added killifish to another four, and the last two he used as controls. And then he looked at the guppies 14 months later, and he noticed that the guppies with the killifish, um, they were still brightly colored and large, and the guppies with the pike, drabbed color and small. So he mimicked this in the lab. Okay, well, that's pretty good data. How about mimic it in, in, in the real world, the field experiments? So he picked two streams with waterfalls, with guppies below, but not above. And I'll tell you why in a second, why he did not want guppies above the waterfall. The pike were below, the killifish were above. Then scientists transplanted guppies from the lower to the upper, and then they went back to monitor it. And despite originating from the lower pool, where there's high predation, environments where they were drabbed color, these guppies rapidly evolved traits that were characteristic of low predation guppies. So these guppies that were transplanted became brightly colored. They matured later on in life. Um, they increased in size, all within a period of about two years. So here's a diagram depicted in his experiments, where I have my killifish that preys mostly on juvenile guppies. Um, I have my guppies up here. The adult males, um, they're brighter colors. This is what's happening up here. Down here, I have my predation, my pike. These guppies, they're small, they're drabbed in color. And we have pools with killifish with no guppies prior to transplant. So, I mean, 
simple experiment. It's beautiful. A more um, in-depth. And you can see here it says two years or 15 generations later, all populations, guppy populations were resampled. And the guppies that were introduced to the upper waterfall were still colorful because of that low predation. The guppies in the mainstream below the waterfall were still less colorful. And our um, colorful guppies that they used as a control were still present. So great experiment. Okay, last section looks at the limits of selection. Remember, I have said this before, genes, they can have multiple effects. One gene can affect many different types of phenotypes. If you remember from chapter 12, it's called paleotropy. Um, so alleles can affect multiple aspects of phenotype. For example, if we have birds or chickens that lay large clutch sizes, the eggs tend to have thinner shells. So, shells. so not only if we increase our clutch size to produce more eggs, um, there's a downside because of that gene also affects how thick the shells will be. Evolution does require genetic variation. Like I said, um, if you don't have genetic variation, then the organism isn't going to change. And so we'll talk about racehorses here. Over 80% of the gene pool of thoroughbred horses in racing can be traced to 31 known ancestors from late 18th century. However, their performances have not improved for more than 50 years. In fact, they're actually getting a little bit slower. And so because of those years of intense selection for thoroughbred horses that had that race and pedigree, um, we've actually removed variation. So there's low genetic variation. Evolutionary change in thoroughbred horses is just not possible. I don't think we'll see a fast racehorse until they've changed their tactics. We also know that gene interaction uh, does affect alleles of um, the fitness of those alleles. So remember, multiple genes interact with each other. So just because you have an allele um, for one gene that may be dominant, epistasis can occur where it kind of trumps that effect on that allele. So epistasis um, yeah, um, can change the outcome, can interact with genes and change the outcome of the organism. I remember that word from somewhere. Epistasis usually causes al albinoism. Mm. So. Cool. No questions. I like it. Just from part two. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, <coughs>